Today is our first Sunday of Advent. So the day we begin our preparations for Christmas. And to get ready for the birth of Jesus, we're going to have a series of sermons. There's four Sundays in Advent. And each of these four Sundays, we're going to look at a passage from the prophet Isaiah, where he asks a question or he makes a statement or a request to God. And then we're going to look at a passage from the Gospel of John, where Jesus answers that question of Isaiah or responds to those statements or questions. Each of those passages in the Gospel of John are things that Jesus said during the Last Supper as he's preparing to go to the cross. So one of the things that would be highlighted in each of these four sermons is that the birth of Jesus, Christmas, is really his first step to the cross. It's the beginning of his journey to the cross. And we'll see that the cross is God's solution to our biggest problem, that is sin. Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. How the mountains would quake in your presence. As fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sin sweeps us away like the wind. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sin. And yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We all are formed by your hand. Don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray, and see that we are all your people. So here we have it. We're going to look at this passage instead of just strictly in order. We're going to look at it first. Isaiah states the problem. You've been angry with us because we're not godly. We're constantly sinners. How can people like us be saved? Isaiah is asking these questions. We're all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they're nothing but filthy rags. And like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins, our sins sweep us away like the wind. Now, Isaiah was active preaching uh, more than 500 years before Jesus lived. It was a low time in the history of Israel. The people had forgotten who they were. So even the things they did that were the right things, like worshiping in the temple and following the Ten Commandments, they did them for the wrong reasons. This is why Isaiah says, our righteous deeds are nothing but filthy rags. They are in a downward spiral that's threatening to destroy the entire nation. So Isaiah makes this plea. Now, according to Isaiah, our sin, that he's speaking of these people in Israel, that their sin is, it is constant. It's an infection that makes them impure, like filthy rags, and sweeps us away like leaves. I think in this day and age, dealing with a Uh, a pandemic caused by a virus, probably number two and three we can all relate to in some level. 
that this infection and we worry about passing that or we worry, people around us worry about getting it from us. So when Isaiah looked at the situation, he understood that sin caused God to be angry with the people. So he pleads with God about that situation. He's like, don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Isaiah is worried that God will close the door on Israel. That just as God chose Abraham and his descendants, he can just as easily unchoose them. Look for someone else to be his people. Their nation is in chaos, self-induced chaos, but chaos nonetheless, and they're vulnerable. Without God's protection, Isaiah believes that they'll be overrun by their enemies. So Isaiah is pleading with God to find a way to forgive the people. They are guilty. Isaiah doesn't try and sugarcoat that. He doesn't try and explain anything away. He says, we are ungodly. We are. The best we can do are like filthy rags. And so he pleads with God, simply don't remember our sin forever. Instead, look at us, we pray, and see that we are all your people. When God looks at Israel, Isaiah wants him to see his people, his children, and not just a bunch of sinners, not just a bunch of bad people. Isaiah is asking God to step out of his role as judge and instead fulfill the role as creator and father, because that's what he says. He says, and yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We all are formed by your hand. Isaiah is not blaming God that, that they're sinners. He's not saying, okay, God, you know, we're sinners, but you made us this way. That's not what Isaiah is saying. He is asking God to remember his responsibilities towards them as their creator and as their father, the same way that an earthly parent has responsibilities towards their children to protect them, to help them, to love them. Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. That's where Isaiah started this whole passage, that you would burst from the heavens and come down. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations, and oh, how the mountains quaked. He, he's referring to the time of Moses, when God came down and rescued the people and led them out of slavery and, and tried to lead them into the promised land, though they were slow to follow. Gave them the Ten Commandments, the, the Torah, the law, God's instructions on how to live. And the mountains literally shook. And Isaiah is reasoning, maybe, just maybe, if God does some stuff like that again. And remember, this happened a thousand years before, uh, before Isaiah lived. This is ancient history to Isaiah and the people. And he's saying, God, if, if you would come and do the things you did in ancient times, perhaps the people would listen. If you came down and shook the mountains and, and gave us more rules to follow, and we followed those rules, just maybe we can fix things. So Isaiah correctly diagnoses the problem that our sin is creating all kinds of problems, separating us from God. And so Isaiah believes the solution is God needs to come and visit the people like he did in the old days. Just like when God came down from Moses, the burning bush, the pillar of fire, all of those things, giving the Ten Commandments, all that, so he's like, come and do that stuff again, God. But God has other plans. He's going to come and visit. 
but he's going to visit different than he did at the time of Moses. He's going to come in something we call the incarnation. Now, the incarnation is the Christian belief that God assumed a human nature and became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. This, this incarnation, this God becoming human, it's not God possessing a person. It's not God having pretending to be a person. It is a true union of, of, of the human and the divine. It is a person, Jesus, who is actually, truly, really, completely, fully human, but is also completely, really, truly, and fully God. That's God's solution. Well, it's the first step in the solution because the incarnation by itself doesn't, it does not solve the problem of sin. It's the first step on the path to the solution, which is the cross. So as Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross to bring about the solution to the problem, he's about to be arrested and killed. He's having his last supper with the disciples. And during that last supper, he says to them, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Now, John wrote this in Greek. So when he was writing down this quote from Jesus, he had several choices on what word to use for love. Greek has four different words for love. And the word that John used here is one that some of you are probably familiar with. It's agape. Agape means an unconditional, unearned love. So Jesus says to the disciples, I have loved you not because of what you have done, but because of who I am. That's what I do. I love unconditionally. And when you love each other the same way, not because of who another person is or what they've done, but because of who you are, when you love that way, you are remaining or living in my love. Now, Jesus told the disciples, he told the crowds, that there's really only two things they need to do. He said, all of this, all the commandments, all of the scriptures are contained in these two commands. Love God, love your neighbor. This isn't, it wasn't, that's not something Jesus made up. That's not new with him. It, it was being said from way back in the time of Moses. Hear, O Israel, they call it, the, in, Israel, in, in Hebrew, they call it the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. It's one of their oldest commandments. But don't look at the prophets again. Specifically at the prophet Micah, because here's what Micah said. Micah said, God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah told the people that if they didn't do those things, if they don't love justice, if they don't love kindness, if they don't walk humbly with their God, Nothing else really matters. All the rest is, is ruined by not doing that. If they go to the temple and worship and they give their tithes and they follow the commandments perfectly, it doesn't matter if they don't love justice and don't love kindness and don't walk humbly with, the God, with God. So as Jesus is, is emphasizing these things that the that have been said back all the way to the times of Moses and reiterated by the prophets. He says, I've told you these things so you can be filled with my joy, or it can be also translated, so my joy can be made complete in you. Yes, your joy will overflow. Every time I read this passage, I think of Jesus talking, at the woman, talking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, when Jesus says, if, if she drinks from that well, it will be like a life spring uh, bubbling up in her that will never end. Their joy will overflow. This is my commandment, 
love each other in the same way I have loved you. Jesus is going to go into more details about what that means, about how he's about to love them. But if we look back leading up to this moment, we see primarily the way he loved them. He left the comforts and security of heaven and living God's presence to come to earth, to live a very human life that for most of it, up until the last three years, he was just a guy doing a job, taking care of the people around him, living that life of what it means to follow what he's telling his disciples to follow. But he has something greater in mind here. Because remember, this is the Last Supper. He's going to the cross. So he says, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend. You are my friends. If you do what I command. Remember his command, love the way I have loved. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father has told me. So she says, love the way I've loved. Love because that's who you are. That's what you do. Not because of the other person. Not because they've earned it. Not because they deserve it. Because I am a person who loves. And if you want to follow me, you are a person who loves. You didn't choose me, Jesus says. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. If you haven't figured it out yet, Jesus wants us to love each other. Here's what you can do this week. Spend some time thinking about the current state of our culture. Think about the political and social climate that we currently live in. It's filled with hate, derision, animosity. It's us versus them mentality. And contrast this, that to what Jesus has just said. Jesus has said, I chose you. I chose to love you. Not because of who you are, not because of what you did, but because of who I am. He says that to his disciples. He says, you didn't choose to be loved by me. I chose to love you. I think that if Christians would, would if we would get out of the judging business, if we'd get out of the judging game, and we get into the loving game, we could change our entire nation. If we would follow this one command of Jesus, the one command he says we're really supposed to follow above all the others, we could change. We could change our communities. We could change our nation. We could change the world. If we'd stop the finger pointing, Isaiah says that in another place, stop pointing the finger, and we would start doing what Jesus says we're to do, to, to love, because that's what he did. He loved. It's in his nature to love. Isaiah thought God could fix our problem by coming down and making the mountains quake. Then God would give us a bunch more rules to follow, just like with Moses. And if we followed those rules, we could make everything right. Instead, God came in the person of Jesus to give himself as a sacrifice. And he instructs his followers to do the same. So we see that God's answer to our dilemma, sin, was not to judge us, but to remove that judgment by becoming one of us. This is our first step in, un in understanding what God was really doing when we see that baby in the manger on Christmas. Let us pray. 
Lord God, as we come before you in this beginning of our journey to Bethlehem, the beginning of our journey to stand beside the manger and see the incarnate Jesus, the God become flesh. We pray that you will make this a season of joy, a season of hope, and a season of blessings that we will share with one another. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.